So I'm Russell Defner. Um, yeah, actually, Arnold didn't introduce herself as my wife, but she is. And so we live half the time in the Philippines and half the time in Colorado. So uh, uh, my history, uh, which I'll get into a little bit more here, but yeah, I, I too basically started my OSM journey through um, roughly disaster mapping slash resilience um, projects. So uh, I'll get into that as I, I move along. Let me try to advance the slides. There we go. As I was saying, you know, I I, I was introduced to OpenStreetMap kind of in a roundabout way, and maybe a lot of people kind of uh, had a similar experience where it actually came up in another software, or you know, kind of um, by using another software, another platform. I was introduced to OpenStreetMap because. I wanted to test it out, and I looked at my hometown, and I said, "What is this mess?" Um, for I think you know the OSM US uh, crowd knows well uh, the Tiger data. So you know um, the area I was living in in Park County, Colorado, was all just raw Tiger data, and and you know uh, just a gigantic mess that I um, didn't want to fix myself. So I <laughs> went on the internet and I started searching, you know, like what is this OpenStreetMap thing? How do I start editing, uh, you know, is there support? Can I, you know, ask for help, et cetera? And landed on um, actually a meetup group called OpenStreetMap Colorado. This group, um, maybe some of you might recognize or if you're watching back, um, some people might be able to pick out, um, Steve Coast is actually in this picture. He was there at this mapathon that I wound up at, at. So, you know, getting to talk to like the founder of OpenStreetMap kind of in my early um, journey really influenced you know uh, me sticking around and actually uh hurricane who's also in the picture his uh to be wife was the one that kind of pushed me to do a talk at state of the map 2011 which was actually the first kind of formal meeting of the humanitarian open street map team they they had just founded uh, um not quite a year before that uh but it was kind of the, the first time uh, a large number of them got together and, and kind of started talking about you know the plan um, and, and what OpenStreetMap or what humanitarian OpenStreetMap team would end up being. Um, so to just give a little bit of a, a background on HOT, as the acronym says, uh, we're going back to 2010, uh, you know, January of that year, the, the massive earthquake that hit Haiti uh, was really sort of the, the solidifying, it wasn't the first time that OpenStreetMap had been used in sort of the humanitarian context, but it was the first time that a few tools were kind of put into practice um, and and also just that the, the founding members kind of formalized and decided to uh, pursue becoming an NGO. Uh, it's a little graph here on, on the progress, you know, Port-au-Prince looked like this right before the Port of Prince Haiti, I should specify, um, you know, right before the, the earthquake. And then, you know, as, as it says, 18 days later, volunteers from around the world came together and, and started trace, tracing the imagery and adding their local knowledge. And you have this, you know, kind of amazing progression in a very short period, period of time to a map that's actually usable for disaster response. So it really you know, solidified the, the concept and really gave the push for this to, to become a thing um, for, for the founding members to get together, um, you know, draft articles of incorporation on all the things that it takes to become an organization. And we were born. Um, a lot has changed since you know, 2010. And uh, even you know, in the last couple of years, a lot, a lot has, um, hot has grown a lot. Um, in, in number of staff, in number of places we're working, um, you know, the, the types of services we provide, uh, you know, disaster response still remains kind of a, a key uh, function of, of HOT, but it's really not as dominant as it used to be. Now we do a lot of, uh, you know, what we, what we could just call resiliency mapping, right? I mean, whether that's um, for economic development, uh, preparedness, all of those things, uh, you know, we, we kind of have our, our hands in uh, uh, many of those areas. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the, the technology, the tasking manager being uh, the piece of technology that most people have heard of and probably 
used, at least everybody on the call has probably uh, done some uh, mapping through the tasking manager. But you know, I am yeah, I'm the response coordinator, and my focus is specifically on disaster response. Even though you know, I definitely am consulted and, and in part of conversations about um, resiliency mapping or, or preparedness mapping, um, or even you know, um, the DRR as as you know the other acronym that gets thrown around the disaster risk reduction programs that we do. Uh, but my focus really is on the some event happens, you know, earthquake, typhoon, uh, whatever it happens to be, and HOT evaluates, you know, what needs to be done and, and kind of like the scale of resources that we're going to need in order to uh, provide data for the response. What did I miss? Oh. So one good example, um, and we have this nice gra graphic uh, to kind of demonstrate uh, for Hurricane, Hurricane Maria, uh, that really devastated Puerto Rico, uh, you know, a couple of years back. We pretty much mapped the entire island. Uh, obviously, there was already mapping there. You know, OpenStreetMap contributors um, locally, as well as you know, people that uh, tourists are just interested in, in Puerto Rico had had done a lot of mapping, but um, a, a large portion of the island was still unmapped. You know, the interior portions and you know the the less populated areas. So. You know, in, in a pretty short time frame, I don't actually, maybe I have the, the numbers here. Oh, I don't have the numbers of how long this response was, but you know, I, I wanna say it was less than a month. Um, yeah, we had, you know, over 5,000 people, um, 45,000 kilometers of roadway and a million and a half buildings were added to the island. And I like this example because, you know, it's it, like, well, and I don't know if you're like me, I like mapping islands as well because they have a defined boundary, and you know you can really feel uh, like that you you completed something uh, once you've you know mapped an island from from shore to shore, so to speak. Uh, but it also kind of gives us that container of you know how long did it take to map this particular island, and we can kind of you know gauge uh, for future events you know what it might take to to map uh, a similar area. And then just a little bit, of course, the, the, we, we do this for a reason, and, and the reason um, is, is multifold, but uh, obviously one big reason is our partner agencies, you know, Red Cross, um, in the case of Puerto Rico, uh, actually FEMA requested us to, to map buildings as well. Um, and then, yeah, like the, the broader sort of digital humanitarian network or the, the humanitarian to humanitarian networks all kind of benefit from um, all the mapping that gets done basically by, you know, just regular old open street map contributors who happen to, to give it, uh, their time during a response. Um, and then, you know, obviously we, we hope and, and, and we, we do a lot to try to help the partner organi organizations actually put this data into action or, you know, into um, decision making, whether that's, you know, kind of pre-planning uh, for events or actually planning, you know, a, a search and rescue or, or um, recovery operation, that kind of thing. Uh, and then I have a few slides in here that I'm probably just going to skip through because I think I'm probably taking longer than I originally uh, thought. But you know, malaria was a good example of you know they needed the the buildings in you know a huge portion of Africa that they were um, doing malaria spraying. Um, so we can, you know, map the buildings and they can uh, estimate how much spray they need, those kind of things. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I, I can't do this presentation without kind of mentioning the most recent stuff that's happened is uh, HOT was actually selected by um, the Audacious Project, um, which is uh, kind of a, uh, a sub thing that the, the TED initiative uh, does. So, you know, this is a, a very highly competitive uh, funding mechanism and it's actually like multiple funders and they kind of kind of like if you've seen the show Shark Tank, um, you know, you, you have to sell yourself to uh, the donors and they, they decide kind of how much uh, to back your next five years. So we actually got quite a bit. Uh, I don't think we got, you know, all the funding that was available, but um, we got a, a large amount of funding for the next five years, which has dramatically changed on um, the hot that we were even just a year ago. Uh, you know, we have 
probably double the amount of employees, if not more. I'm not sure the, the exact numbers because we're we're still hiring and, and trying to to fill um, gaps or, or positions that we we identified as necessary to achieve our goals. Uh, but they are, as as you see here, to to map an area home to one billion people. Um, that's across 94 priority countries, and yeah, obviously they they took into consideration um, when they built that list their sort of um, disaster risk. And to conclude uh, and hand it over, um, you know, I just want to say to especially you know people. Uh, volunteers on the, the line right now, but also I'm um, watching the recording later. We have a great opportunity for volunteers to get a little more involved in OpenStreetMap than just you know digitizing um, imagery and those kind of things. So you know that's kind of what we're known for is rallying the crowd to to digitize. But we also need people in that coordination realm. Uh, so if you're interested in getting further involved than uh, just you know jumping on the tasking manager and mapping, uh, please look, uh, you know jump onto our Slack. Uh, I'm on there all the time, pretty much you know, and that's kind of our our, our biggest um, sort of 24/7 communication channel. Um, you, you can just go to that link slack.howtosim.org and and do the the quick sign up there. Um, you can also go one step further and jump right into training to become an activator, as we call them. So these are the people that are helping, uh, you know, determine what's lacking in OpenStreetMap and, and whether the imagery quality is good enough or, um, you know, all of those things that we kind of have to go through uh, in order to get people mapping. Uh, and then on the, the back end, kind of, you know, doing validation and quality assurance. And then, uh, you know, all the myriad of things that happen uh, when we're coordinating with partners and, and the the local OpenStreetMap community. Uh, so yeah, you can just go to courses.hotosm.org and get started there. And then lastly, uh, yeah, disaster services at hotosm.org will contact me as well as my partners, um, Tony and Claudio, who are the disaster uh, information officer and Tony is the disaster services lead. So the idea behind uh, resiliency maps is that I am a long time uh, volunteer and person who's worked in open source and I did not have a map for my go bag. I am from San Francisco. Uh, and so we're very concerned about earthquakes here. And the, the basic idea is um, that we are looking for ways to use open source to navigate any kind of emergency. Um, and this is what San Francisco looked like 30 years ago when the last earthquake hit. We're due for another one. The good thing to come out of this was the neighborhood emergency response team called NERT. It's now at a national level, it's called CERT. I don't know if anyone's involved in this, wants to know more about it, but it's very basic civilian training. And the idea is that you don't find yourself squashed under one of these pancake buildings. Um, I really didn't think about using OpenStreetMap for this uh, until I changed my neighborhood and had to recertify. And I realized I was in a neighborhood where there was just a lot more things that could go wrong. Um, so earthquakes, you know, the whole idea about navigating whatever your disaster is, the ones near you. Earthquakes are the most deadly. Um, and obviously the fact that you can't predict them has a lot to do with it. Uh, but the more I looked into it and the more that we started talking with community members through NERT um, is that a lot of these other situations are things that are happening now. So here in San Francisco, we have drought, flooding, oh, and of course the wildfires along with the extreme temperatures. So those are all things that are more predictable and that are a obviously bigger problem. So this is my preaching to the choir slide. Um, and I will say one of the things is that it really makes a big difference if you evangelize in the community, whatever community work you do about why it needs to be open source. And so I talk about this a lot and, and everyone on this call understands that these are all things that are obviously on open street maps. So a resiliency map shows you the assets and the hazards of a given geographical area in, in the way that you can hopefully navigate them, right? 
So things like hospitals, schools, fire stations, that kind of stuff, obviously those are assets. Now the hazards are interesting because OpenStreetMap actually treats those better uh, than Apple and Google Maps. And the reason that matters is that a lot of times when you're doing community work, it's not, you're not up against somebody with an Esri license. You're up against somebody who is used to using Apple or Google Maps. And they say, well, why don't we do this? Um, and there were cases here in San Francisco where people had gone through excruciating detail out mapping every weekend. Uh, and then Google changed its API and none of this work was accessible. Also, you had the problem that some neighborhoods were more active than others. I would say one of the interesting things of NERC participation is that it tends to be a lot of homeowners, which are never gonna be the majority in a place like San Francisco. Um, but with OpenStreetMap, anybody can contribute. If you work here, you study here, you can add a point to the map and make it better for everyone. And everybody who's listening to this understands that that's the point of it, but it's worth um, listening to, uh, thinking about, and also the fact that it's not just some free for all. This last point has come up a lot. So here is a look at my neighborhood. Um, and again, the interesting thing is if you live in a place that's dynamic, OpenStreetMap treats a lot of those features, like here we have the construction site is the um, area outlined here. But if you were trying to get, um, let's say the Market Street from here, you can see there's a giant construction site and around it, there are auto shops. Uh, let's see what else is there. There's a collision center, refrigeration supplies, who knows what's in there. So those are all things that you're gonna wanna avoid. On the other side of the street, you can also see there's a, a small hotel, which if you live in the neighborhood, you know it's an SRO. So if you're looking to try to help other people, you also want to know where those people are. Um, the nice thing about OpenStreetMap, again, and this is another evangelist idea, is that you can customize it to work for your city. So these are police and fire call boxes. They run on telegraph technology, and they're the only thing guaranteed to work in an earthquake. There's um, about 2,000 of them, one every two blocks. And San Francisco has a great open data portal, but these aren't on there. And the best way to get them is to get, we had kind of a points challenge of people going around and dropping a pin on these. It matters because again, these are good features to have in an emergency, um, but you have no way of knowing where they are. Because one of the important things about thinking about a lot of emergencies is that you're gonna have no connectivity. Your phone, you're not gonna run down your battery. You need to have these things offline. Um, then we, ha after having done a series of mapathons and workshops, we were asked by the San Francisco Fire Department to make a couple of neighborhood maps. So again, this whole project started with my go bag map and that's not what we ended up doing. So I still am working on mine, which would have more detailed information like you see here, but what the fire department and the community wanted were very simple maps. Uh, this is part of one neighborhood and they only have four things on them. One are the district boundaries as decided by the police department. So everybody who's trained as one of these nerds knows these boundaries, right? It just has the uh, battalion, which is the only fire station that's gonna be open in an emergency and the fire department. So that's it. So the idea is these are black and white. You can print them to 1117 or 24 to 36 at any standard copy center. That was, that was the brief. That's all they have. People could get them out. You could always laminate it or make a bunch of copies and draw on one and redo it every year. But that was the basic idea for those. Uh, this is our toolkit. And again, it really helps if you're working in a larger community to have people understand that there's so much you can do with OpenStreetMap, that there's just a whole constellation an ecosystem, if you will, of ways to get things done because it's not always immediately apparent. Um, COVID really flipped it for us as it did for most people. But I think the reason is because it's a different kind of disaster. So almost all of the other kinds of disasters, there are certain ways that you can prepare. Um, the rule of thumb was 72 hours worth of food, sheltering in place for an earthquake. Um, that's it. Uh, that's way different from two hours, 14 days sheltering in your home uh, with your loved one. With connectivity, for that, that's a thing. There's you need to find different things because obviously you don't want to tell people to go into a church or a school or someplace where it's going to be crowded, uh, but everybody has connectivity. So there's a lot more you can do with what people need to find. Now, uh, as a rule, the idea was everybody shelters in place, but San Francisco 
there are a lot of people here who cannot shelter in place. We have about 8,000 homeless people. And when the main library, all the libraries, the public places, everything was on lockdown, there are no bathrooms. There's no place to wash your hands. So the city had long had what they called pit stops. There were 23 of them before COVID and they added 25. But obviously the question is, how do you find it, okay? So this is the Google map that the city put out. Um, and I think we all go to die on a hill of map labeling, but I, I think we can agree that this is noisy and there are some problems with it. Um, not all of these places are open 24 seven. The only way that you could find that out is if you click on and then the hours show up in the sidebar. So this is limited use. Um, these are gonna be people with mobile phones on the street trying to figure out where they can wash their hands. And I don't think you're gonna get it on this map. So we had kind of a guerrilla cartography moment where we decided to hit these, this information with the biggest simple stick we could think of and make a very simple, very pared down printed maps that only showed one neighborhood. And this is basically the same neighborhood that you're looking at here. Um, so you can see the difference. Uh, the, the base layer from the city data portal, we did it with QGIS and the labels are, the icons are humanitarian labels, but that's it. Um, and then we, th these are all printed an eight by 11 standard printer, black and white. Then we and a bunch of other people went out and posted them everywhere. Uh, so the idea was, you, you, you're not going to get all the bathrooms in the city, but you know you need a place to wash your hands somewhere around here. Um, and we have been going back and forth with the city, especially our local supervisor here talking about this. One of the obstacles they have now is that they're taking some of them away. So it really is information that people need to know. Again, resiliency, basic humanity, it's all there. Um, so I guess this is, I, I, I mislabeled the slides. This take away, but it's a bit of a rant. And that is, it's really easy, even in a place that we consider a wealthy city with a lot of technology to make bad maps in an emergency. So this arrived in, on paper at my house a week ago and San Francisco was on track to be the uh, first major city with herd immunity. So you're sending this to me now and it was in four languages and I get it, you've got a committee approving this stuff. This is the flip side. Um, and honestly, this is a case where I would have killed this map. I can't understand, there are no street names on this map. And the only reason I can tell you where San Francisco General is on that insert is because you, if you know that the neighborhood, it sort of bows out, it's almost an entire city block. Um, but there was a lot of this. I had worked with some volunteers to get groups of seniors either tested or shopped. And we found ourselves going onto Reddit to find the Twitter bots, the uh, Telegram channels, people had done independent sites that were basically a lot of these, aside from the bots, they were a lot of them GIS based. So it's like, where can I find a vaccine near me? Who can do this? When can I do it? How do I get it done? And I think this is really indicative to me of how much work I feel like we have to do in the community and living in that space between community base and government to, to get things done because there's just no reason for this, for this map. Um, and I, I just, I, I think we can all do better and I think open street maps can get us there. I think we have a lot of great tools and it, in a way it's, this is the inspiration from the crisis. I think we were taken off the, the road we were doing to make these go maps, map, which we're still doing, but I mean, it's, we got sort of sidelined. And I think this is a really interesting Thing for us to look at. So that's it. And questions, comments, etc. This is where to find me. Thanks.